All right. In the last class before the film, we had been talking about uh, the uh, stroke. We had talked about dementia. We talked about the uh, different ways that brain damage, um, the procedures that doctors use to evaluate brain damage. So uh, we're gonna pick it up right here. We've covered some of this. Uh, I don't know if you remember when I talked about the corpus callosum, how the two doctors had that epileptic patient. And so they went ahead and they severed the corpus callosum and they found out that uh, that helped the patient, but it also gave them the uh, information that the two halves, uh, they, function, they can function independently. And in many ways, they have certain tasks that they focus on. It is not quite as polarized as we once thought, but I'm gonna give you a general idea uh, of the different functions of the, of the brain. And I know that's a little, a little blurry. I don't know, I, I think that's from the, uh, I don't know how to, how to crisp that picture up any. Uh, the, uh, like I said, it's not quite polarized, but basically the right brain adds emotional content to speech. It has limited language functions. The right brain is involved with insight. Many times you'll hear that the right brain is the creative brain. It's intuitive. It thinks in a holistic way. It looks at the big picture. It tends to be subjective instead of objective. It also is kind of the feeling uh, type of uh, uh, part of the brain, uh, the emotional type. It's the part of the brain dealing a lot with the imagination. It likes to stay in the present and look to the future. Doesn't like to live in the past. It's the philosophical and religious part of the brain it's the appreciating part of the brain. It's the impetuous part of the brain. And it's the risk-taking part of the brain. It's the right brain that'll say, you know, it sounds like it'd be a really good idea to get in a plane and go up about, oh, 3,000 feet, put a backpack on your uh, back and jump out of it and feel free as you are falling through space. The right brain says, that sounds like a rush. You know? the left brain, the logical part of the brain. It likes to think in sequential thinking. The analytical part of the brain. It tends to be the rational part of the brain. The objective part of the brain. It is detail oriented. It likes to look at the different parts. The right brain likes to take a holistic looking at the big picture. The left brain likes the detail oriented and looking at the different parts. <clears throat> Left brain loves facts. Left brain likes to live in the present and the past. It's the math and science part of the brain. Reality-based part of the brain. It's the practical, the practical part of the brain. 
and it's the safe part. Get in a plane and go up 3,000 feet and jump out, jump out with a backpack with some silk in that backpack. I don't think that sounds very safe at all. Hmm. I'm not sure that that's the best thing for us to do. Okay. So it's going to it's going to hopefully rein in some of the uh, impetuous risk taking parts that the right brain seeks. We have talked about neurotransmitters. There are three types of neurotransmitters, three classes of neurotransmitters. There's a small molecule, the peptides, and the gases. So three classes of neurotransmitters, small molecule, peptides, and gases. Under the small molecule, class. The first one is acetylcholine. Okay. Acetylcholine. This is used by the parasympathetic nervous system. It slows the heartbeat and act reactivates the gastric system when the body's been in fight or flight. So when you get in the fight, and fly, fight or flight and your heart starts beating real fast and that gastric activity is inhibited, the acetylcholine helps to bring that back to homeostasis. It's plentiful in the membrane and it also helps in memory and movement. Okay, under small molecule, another classification or another type is catecholamines. First under that is norepinephrine. We used to call this noradrenaline, okay? It's used by the sympathetic nervous system to help enact fight or flight. So you've got acetylcholines that uh, will calm on fight or flight, but your norepinephrine helps rev up your body. Serotonin, we're gonna camp here for a couple of minutes. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's very, very important in mood and sleep. It also helps in impulse control and it's implicated in aggression. Now, they have run studies. Now, when we say mood, it's serotonin that we look at when somebody has depression. And a lot of the times the doctor will give an antidepressant to try and increase the serotonin uptake to increase the mood, to make the person less depressed. They have done studies and those people who commit suicide, they have, during autopsies, they have found that these people have a critically low level of serotonin. It's imperative, if you know somebody who has depression, and especially if their depression looks like it's getting worse, find a way to get them to a doctor because first of all, that serotonin has to be increased. Uh, I think we've already established that I'm not one that um, supports assisted suicide. And this is one of the reasons. If a person is very, very depressed, but they can be helped by giving them something to increase the serotonin, and that serotonin lifts their mood, I think they can be thinking straighter. When you're depressed, you are not thinking. You're not thinking with all your cylinders. And you're not thinking real clear. And so uh, the serotonin is very, very important 
in depression and it can be very, very uh, important in suicides. Now, the interesting thing about serotonin, it's the only neurotransmitter that we get from something that is eaten, okay? Foods that are high in tryptophan, the body uses that tryptophan to help uh, form the serotonin. Now, we are quickly heading toward a national holiday celebrating gluttony. For weeks, if not months, we plan out a huge banquet that we're going to set out in food. We are just so happy thinking about family and friends that's going to join us and we sit down and we eat until our eyes pop out. We get up and say, oh, I shouldn't have eaten so much. Then we go down and lie down on the couch and we sleep for a couple of hours and then we repeat the process. Some people will watch Thanksgiving football games after eating and fall asleep on the couch. Now, turkey is extremely high in tryptophan. So, when we have Thanksgiving and we are really, really, really taking in that turkey, it's being used to increase the serotonin. And what happens? The serotonin then causes us to be sleepy, to relax, and we go to sleep and go into turkey comas, okay? Dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is important for us to be able to experience pleasure. Without dopamine, it is very hard to be able to experience any kind of pleasure and, and reward. Um, and so it's very, very important. Also, Dopamine is very, very important. We're finding out that it's really, really uh, implicated in uh, addictions. Yeah. And the, uh, the person, that we, you know, we've done studies and with Parkinson's, it looks like people have a deficit in dopamine and so you'll see the, the, the typical kind of uh, Parkinsonian movements. Whereas those who have schizophrenia have too much dopamine and it increases a lot of the type of uh, activity movements. So we've got acetylcholine, we've got catecholamines, then we have what's called GABA. It's an amino acid. Very important, and they think that there's a possible link to epilepsy. Glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It's used by more neurons than any other neurotransmitter. Then we have peptides. Peptides weren't discovered until the late 60s and early 70s. What happened was that <clears throat> they decided to do what's called tagging and they tagged morphine to see what happens in the brain with it. They found that the morphine had 
receptor sites that it locked into. Now, that's kind of interesting. This drug had a receptor site that it was just made for. Now, the question is, why morphine? You know, it's not like when, uh, when we happened on this earth that there was anticipation that we were going to have to have uh, surgery or we were going to have times in great pain and so we might as well have a receptor site just in case. It doesn't work that way. And the scientists knew it didn't work that way. Why have a receptor site that is not being used? It's just, just in case receptor site. So the question was, I wonder if we have a natural morphine that the body creates nature's opiates. Now, nature's morphine, nature's opiate, morphine reduces pain. Morphine reduces tension and morphine increases the mood. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all have had surgery and had morphine, but what it does in many ways makes you just don't care whether or not you're in pain. But in doing so, it seems to kind of reduce the idea of pain, increases the mood, and uh, reduces the tension. Nature's morphine does the same thing. We do produce a natural opiate, a natural morphine. These are called endorphins. And that's exactly what they do. They reduce pain, reduce tension, increase the mood. Now, there are ways to stimulate the release of endorphins. Have you ever come out of a real, real funny show or gone to the comedy club and you've been laughing for an hour or two hours and when you come out, you're just feeling great? That's because laughter releases endorphins. And after you get laughing real hard, chemically, you have a lot of endorphins that are being released and it makes you feel better. Exercise. When you exercise, endorphins are released. Okay. Um, eating chocolate. The darker the chocolate, the more endorphins. Um, usually we have two or three guys in class. I'll just speak to you. If you have some bad news to drop on your lady friend, okay. Get a pound or two of really good chocolate and load her up with chocolates and then drop the bomb. You know, that, uh, that'll help prepare her and have those endorphins and it'll go a little easier. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, before, when you have PMS and you say, I want chocolate, get it. Don't worry about pounds. Get the chocolate and eat it. It will make you feel better. Get chocolate. The darker the better, but any chocolate will make you feel better, but the darker the better. Yeah. The darker yeah, the better, the more know. endorphins. Okay? Endorphins are our friend. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I've got a picture of an endorphin. Yeah, look at that. That's a picture of an endorphin. And actually, you can get this picture off of YouTube and it's show it walking along. They have a cute little uh, music that goes with it. But it's just walking right along there, just kind of do, 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 do. But I always thought that was kind of interesting to see that. 
We have gases that act as neurotransmitters. Nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide. Nitrous oxide, chemically known as NO, and carbon monoxide, CO, act as neurotransmitters. When they are released by a neuron, it will spread to nearby neurons. It sends a signal that affects chemical reactions inside those neurons, and they do not have to bind like the other neurotransmitters. Nitrous oxide is not stored in the vesicles. Most neurotransmitters are stored in the vesicles. Nitrous oxide is not. It can be released from any part of the cell. Nitrous oxide is also responsible for penile erections and for formation of glimmers. The next thing we want to talk about the endocrine system. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, what in the world does this have to do with psychology? You're going to be surprised how much this does affect us. And when we're talking about biology and psychology, there is a lot of this dovetailing and segue into those. We're going to be talking about the pituitary, the thyroid, the adrenal, the pancreas, the ovaries, and the testes, and I think that's it. The endocrine system deals with glands, okay? It is a system composed of glands. An endocrinologist is a doctor that specializes in treating glands. first gland that we're going to talk about is the pituitary. It is known as the master gland. If it starts screwing up, it can cause other glands not to function correctly. Okay? We have the posterior part of the pituitary and the anterior part. Okay? The posterior part is back there, and here's the anterior. There are hormones, and hormones are the chemicals that are secreted by glands. We have hormones that come out of the posterior pituitary. One is vasopressin. It regulates the fluid balance in the body. Now, the next one's oxytocin. It stimulates uterine contractions during labor. It um, is involved in the release of breast milk. Now, this is the first hormone that we're going to talk about that is connected to psychology. Oxytocin is the love hormone. It is released, especially when you are in hugs and uh, it is involved in social bonding and facilitating trust and attachment. So there's a very good example right there of why we're studying the endocrine system. Prolactin stimulates the secretion of breast milk, somatotropin. It is the growth hormone that acts directly on muscles and bones to produce growth during puberty. Adrenocorticotrophic hormone, it's referred to as ACTH. Here we go, it's linked to learning and memory. It causes the adrenal gland to secrete cortisol, which is used in producing glucose. Now these are from the anterior pituitary. Here we have the posterior, which is vasopressin, oxytocin. Under the anterior pituitary uh, category, the prolactin, somatotropin, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, 
and then what is called the, the thyroid stimulating hormone. about thyroid stimulating hormone, I got to not only talk about the pituitary, but the thyroid, okay? So you have the pituitary, pituitary and it is responsible for TSH. You have your thyroid. Now your thyroid is responsible or thyroxine. Now, the thyroid releases thyroxine, okay? The pituitary monitors that level of thyroxine in your body. So it's keeping an eye and monitoring what the level is. Now, if it perceives that the thyroxine level is less than it should be in the body, it sends a message to the thyroid and the thyroid then starts releasing more thyroxine. it will continue to release more thyroxine as long as the pituitary sends that signal to do that. That depends on it monitoring this and when it perceives then that the level's back to normal, it'll cut back And then this will start becoming less because thyroid will be putting out less thyroxine. Okay, now this goes on constantly. Now, if it perceives that the thyroid has too much thyroxine that it's putting out, it's going to say, we don't need any more. And so now, it's monitoring it. And so it's going to say, we don't need any more. And so it's going to cut back on the thyroid stimulating hormone. And that's what TSH stands for. monitoring, it's monitoring, everything's good, everything's good. Now it says, wait a minute, I'm perceiving it's getting low again. So it sends some TH, it releases TH, TSH, which causes the thyroid to release more thyroxine. Now the thyroxine level is coming back up. It says, okay, we've got enough. and it cuts back on the TSH. This is really, it, a lot of people get confused on this and it's really not confusing. When the thyroid gets low, the pituitary sends out TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. When the thyroxine is too much or just enough, it pulls back on the TSH. Okay, now, when a person has thyroid problems, 
first of all, it can cause confusion. It can cause a, a, a insomnia. It can cause several psychological problems. Also, a person who's having problems with their thyroid, if it's underactive, they're gonna be cold all the time. They will probably start gaining weight. They, um, their hair will start falling out, okay? They can be depressed. Uh, they will complain that they don't have energy, that, that they're becoming more and more, uh, you know, uh, lethargic. If a person is hyperthyroid, then they're going to have bulging eyes. It can cause heart arrhythmias, which means irregular heartbeats. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they will tend to be thin, okay? Because they'll be having a more of a jacked up system. When I went to graduate school, I started, and I, you know, I'd go in, I'd go in and, and as the schooling progressed, I started feeling more and more cold. Got to the point, I was wearing a t-shirt, a shirt, a sweater, a parka with the hood up and gloves and still complaining that the classroom was too cold. I uh, <clears throat> finally decided I need to go to the doctor and find out what's going on. And he said, this is classic thyroid. Let's go ahead and do a thyroid on you and see you know, where we're at. He did a thyroid test on me, TSH, his thyroid panel, and he comes back and he goes, this is something, he goes, you're in the normal on all of your tests. And I said, okay. And he said, I guess I have to refigure this because if you're gaining weight and uh, you're lethargic, then my advice to you is quit oinking up to the trough and exercise. He said, I want you to go on a diet and I want you to start exercising. So the next month I come in, I said, okay, I've been exercising. I've been watching my food, reducing calories, trying to eat better, and I gained some more weight. And he said, well, I really don't believe you. He said, you exercise for six months, you change your diet for six months and you come here, and if, you're gain, if you gain weight again, we'll check and see what's going on. Well, shortly after that, I got a new job had to change doctor panels because of insurance. For many years, every January, I got strep throat. Strep throat and bronchitis, it was like clockwork. Well, I had strep throat, went to my new doctor, and he's palpating the neck, and he said, did you know you've got a swollen thyroid? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And he said, yeah, he goes, you got a, uh, a swollen thyroid. He said, we need to do a thyroid test on you. It's gonna come back normal. He said, no, there's no way. Not gonna come back normal. Okay. It came back normal. He said, this one's beyond me. I'm gonna send you to an endocrinologist. So I went to the endocrinologist and he said, you know, your family physician's really good, he's sharp, he did everything like he was supposed to, but a lot of the doctors don't know to do what's called a free TPO. Free TPO. He said, let's do that on you. Normal, he told me normal was two, and I scored a 75. That measures the inflammation of your thyroid. So I had a real hot thyroid. Now, let's say for the sake of this exercise that when they took my 
thyroid test that I had a very, very high TSH. Would that indicate a over-functioning thyroid or an under-functioning thyroid? The what? Over -function? I hear an over and I hear over. over. Okay. Is that the consensus? You say under? Why would you say that? Bingo. When you leave today, if you'll go by the roll and put a little star, I'm gonna give you extra credit because you are really using your brain. That's exactly right. If I have a high, if I have an overactive thyroid, it's gonna be putting out too much thyroxin. The pituitary is going to see that and it's gonna cut back. But if I have a low functioning thyroid, hypothyroid, which they've determined that I do have, that low functioning means the pituitary is going to have to increase the TSH. And so when they look at that and they see a high TSH, they're going to say something's going on with that thyroid because the pituitary is having to work harder to get that uh, uh, level to be satisfactory, okay? It's really not hard. It's not hard to understand. It's kind of like Dr. Amon said, you know, once you, once you get it, it's not hard at all to understand. And so here, <clears throat> the thyroid, it puts out thyroxin. When it puts out too much, you have a low TSH. When it doesn't put out enough, you're gonna have a high TSH. It's exactly opposite of what you would think. Now. Now. The thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland. It's located under what is called the larynx, which is, we call it the voice box. It is pronounced the larynx, okay? The thyroid secretes thyroxin. If it doesn't secrete enough thyroxin, it's said to be hypothyroid or underactive. If it releases too much thyroxin, it is hyperthyroid. It is overactive, okay? The person is hypothyroid. They're going to gain weight. They're going to be very sensitive to the cold. They're going to have decreased energy and increased fatigue. They may complain of joint pain and they'll have hair loss. And we're not talking about one or two strands. I mean, it'll be noticeable. The hyperthyroid, they will have bulging eyes heart arrhythmia, I wouldn't put a lot in this increased energy, just kind of negate that. But the people that I have known that were hyperthyroid were very thin, okay? Now, um, see, I was thinking about something a second ago, and what was it? Oh, again, how does this figure in with psychology? Had a patient come in. She said she had gained 75 pounds in the last year. I've tried every diet that I can find. I've gone on Weight Watchers. I've done this, I've done that. And she said, my depression is getting worse and worse. And she said, quite frankly, you know, I'm looking at not having a lot to live for. Well, nothing else in her life was kind of 
looking like there was any, any indicator of a, a reason to feel so depressed. So I asked her, I said, have you been feeling like you have less and less energy lately? And she said, well, yeah, I have. And I said, have you been noticing a lot of hair? Like in the sink when you blow, when you do your hair or in the bathtub and such, she said, a tremendous amount. She said, oh. I said, have you been sensitive to cold lately? She said, absolutely. We sent her to the lab and she had a very low functioning thyroid. All these symptoms that she was just attributing to depression was caused by a low thyroid. And so there's many times that we have to say, this is not a therapy issue, but this is a biological issue, okay? Well, I'm not going to start the pancreas today because uh, I wouldn't get through it. I can't do it in 10 minutes. Um, but I think that there's a very, very good chance that we will be finished with this Tuesday, with this chapter. And so uh, we're moving right along on that. Are there any questions about any of this? Any questions, any comments? Uh, everything that's on the PowerPoint is important, but I hope that you've noticed that the things that I add in lecture are also important. And so, uh, when you do your uh, when you do your unit test. I would start using your little tab, using tabs, and like here, tab pancreas, tab uh, thyroid, things like that, so you can refer to them very quickly. Um, if you review something like you know, the anatomy of a cell and you don't quite understand it, ask it, I'll readdress it in, in uh, class, because I want you all to get this. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? That's a great question. And, you know, what do you focus on? Well, certainly you focus on uh, mainly what I talk about in class, but the book is a supplement to my lectures. My lecture is not a supplement to the book. Okay. Anything else? Well, let's go ahead and, and start um, sanitizing your desks. And if there's anything else, Looks like that's it. So I hope you all have a fabulous weekend. Be safe.